So it's 10 a.m. So good morning, everyone. Uh, let me first start by welcoming you all to this PwC webinar uh, called the Aftermath of Trim, where we intend to not only digest the, the key results uh, of the Trim, and Trim we mean the ECV target review of internal models exercise, exercise but also to look ahead um, and try to focus on the, the current and, and most of all upcoming challenges that banks are facing in the RG space. Uh, my name is Luis Verroza. I'm probably part of PwC Network. Uh, I'm based in Lisbon, Portugal, and since 2015 that I'm following up closely all relevant IRB-related uh, regulatory and uh, supervisory developments, where, of course, Stream has gained a major importance. Um, all this long journey uh, has been made with a number of colleagues, uh, and I have no doubt that two of the most experienced and active ones are here today with us, uh, namely Khan Axel and Yosif, to whom I would kindly ask to to do a quick introduction for all of us. Khan, do you um, mind? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Louis. Um, Khan Axel, I've been with PwC for the last 22 years and always in the credit risk modeling area. In the last uh, five years, we have been uh, intensively engaged into uh, support of banks in their struggle to meet the requirements of IRB repair introduced mostly by um, the exercise trim. And today, obviously, we're going to be talking about the main um, implications of trim and the aftermath. Uh, Yosef had been uh, one of our key uh, senior managers in our team. And Yosef, will introduce yourself shortly. risk modeling for the past yes, 10 yes. years yeah and uh, for the past uh, five years since trim has started uh, i've been quite focused on uh, rb remediation projects at, at various uh, banks uh, across the european continent and, and today would be glad to share some thoughts uh, on the, on the outcomes of uh, trim and some remaining challenges uh, that banks are facing with their models yeah. Yes, thank you, Khan. Thank you, Yosef. So, in terms of today's agenda and for the next one hour and a half, so we we'll firstly start with uh, looking at, uh, at the TREAM project report, so a publication that was made by the ECB last April, and basically is a sort of a wrap up of the TREAM project. And basically, we want here to highlight what were the key messages or the key facts, uh, bringing in also some some statistics. But secondly, we are going to focus on selective modeling areas that we consider to be the most challenging ones. So the ones that I will dare to say that all of you have been working or shall continue to work in the upcoming times. And basically, everybody has felt um, tricky or at least not so straightforward or even from operation perspective, complex to look to realize LGD, so how to calculate the economic loss and get this, this final perspective over the losses how to look to the margin of conservatism and try to understand how uh, fit for purpose, how reasonable, and, and of course, how conservative such margin can be at the end of the day, but also looking also to downturn effect, how to incorporate downturn into your CCF and LGD estimates, and basically how this can be done and how comfortable it can be in the approaches that you can put in place. And basically, this shall be the, the heart of this second topic. Thirdly, we, we launched an internal challenge, so internally within our network, so we conducted an internal survey across nine different countries. We tried to uh, ask key questions of the what we think are the most uh, wanted uh, answers that everybody wants to have in, in their own end, and basically arranging topics such as uh, governance arrangements, but also impact, and also in terms of strategy for the IRB for the upcoming year. So, we use certain questions, we collect the answers, and we want to present you the key results. I mean, we cannot promise that they will be representative of what is happening across Europe, but I have no doubt that they will be a clever, or an important source, or at least an interesting source for a further reflection. And that's basically what we want to show you to you. Last but not least, on the last session, we have the Q&A session, so basically around 30 minutes where you can put all your questions, and basically, we try to tackle them on the five-fold perspective. You have a Q&A mechanism on the bottom of your screen, so please start asking your questions as soon as you think 
uh, it makes sense to you. At the end, as I said, we promise to answer all of them. If that is not doable, given the time that we have for this session, we'll answer them later on through email, and basically you will have, for sure, at least our views on the questions that you have raised. And from my side, this is it in terms of uh, introductory notes. So let us move quickly to our first session of today's webinar. So in terms of the TRIM report and the main messages, so the TRIM exercise incorporated more uh, around 200 on-site investigations across credit trees, market trees, and counterparty credit trees. It involved 65 significant institutions. So we are talking more or less around 85% of total assets within the, the Arizona banks. The exercise lasts for five years. So from 2016, the first initiative at that time was basically in terms of preparation and focused on the general topics. But on the following years, we have a lot, a significant number of inspections, a lot of work related to the preparation implementation and then to, to prepare all the final reports. So basically, the objective, overall objective of the stream was to, to ensure that indeed the pillar one models were fit for purpose, that basically um, in, at the end of the day, banks were not facing uh, unrealistic risk weighted assets. And basically, at the end of the day, this was a key result. So it was proved that the models were fit for purpose. Of course, there were significant number of findings, uh, almost 6,000 findings in total across all the risk types. We have around 250 uh, supervisor decisions. Almost three-fourths of those decisions had at least one limitation, which has impact the final risk weighted assets that banks have, have been providing or uh, have been internally using. And basically, at the end of the day, those impacts were estimated at around 12% of risk weighted assets, roughly uh, 70 basis points in terms of the solvency ratio. Must please bear in mind that there were some relevant variants, so basically, individually speaking, banks may have been uh, facing in, a significant increase or at least a higher increase in terms of risk weighted assets. I will also say that in terms of results, so VCD uh, found these exercises being successful in terms of harmonizing practices in the market, in terms of allowing them to know exactly the models that banks were using, and please bear in mind that with the launch of the SFM the majority of the models were inherited from the national supervisor authorities and also to, to confirm that the model outcomes were reliable. And that's a, really a key message here. In terms of next steps, so there will be several follow-up actions to, to confirm that the findings that were identified through the TRIM exercise, they were indeed solved. So banks should continue to invest in improving their models, in particular the models that were not subject to the TRIM exercise. So don't forget all of those models because basically they will also need to be reassessed, in particular having consideration the recent regulatory developments from EBA because they, they, they are also impactful uh, across different areas. Uh, the ECB highlighted the need for further strengthening of the internal validation function and basically in terms of expertise, in terms of number of resources, but also in practices to really provide the right challenge to how the models have been developed and put in place. The ECB announced that there will be uh, really a number, significant number of EMEs, internal model investigations, and that they will also focus on off-site monitoring activities, leveraging on all information that is now available in terms of benchmarking, not only from EBA annual exercise, but also internally. And on the other hand, look into the validation reports, and in particular, look into Annex 2 validation tests that would allow the ECB to compare the, the, the banks across the board. Last but not least, banks are expected to, to make their strategic decisions. There may be significant changes in terms of the modeling landscape, looking ahead to Basel for impact. That's what the ECB is asking banks to reflect and to really understand what they want to, to have in place. Now, moving on to the, the findings and dividing the world in two pieces, so retail and SME, and then looking to low default portfolios. In terms of the retail and SME, uh, both PDs and LGDs, we had 85 investigations, so we are talking here about 53 significant institutions being involved, more or less one to four inspections per, per bank. Uh, across the three parameters, PD, LGD, and TCF, we have around 2,000 findings. But basically, I would say that 70% of those findings were F1, F2, uh, 
So we are talking about 30% being of high severe F3 of F4, and in particular 5% in the highest grade of the scale. There were on average 24 findings being listed, and the maximum that was registered was 50. And in terms of the PD side, at least one uh, high severe finding was identified on roughly two thirds of the institutions. Looking to the LGD side, the things are a little bit more um, severe. 95% uh, of the LGD investigations had at least one uh, high severity finding. And indeed on the LGD, there were a, a lot of situations that were identified. I will say that the regulation has changed and basically uh, this was the, the consequence of such. Looking more, more in detail uh, on the PD side, risk differentiation, low risk differentiation was the main reason for findings that were identified. So if, if you see on the right side of the slide, so roughly 180 findings were identified in these areas. There were some issues on justifying the modeling assumptions and including uh, on the range of application, banks were not properly justifying to which type of exposure they were applying the model or going backwards in terms of the development sample and also how the model was calibrated, there, will be, there were some disalignments in terms of uh, all these relevant scopes. In terms of the calibration and the long run average, there were some issues in justifying what was the, the horizon that was incorporated, that it was sufficiently uh, conservative, at least it had a good mix of bad and good years. And also in terms of the calibration methodology, there were also some issues here basically uh, the lack of proper justification for the selection that was made. In terms of the MOC, so 40% uh, of the banks uh, had an explicit MOC, but 60% didn't have, or well, at least I will say that 10% um, not at all were cons considering an MOC. The remaining was more or less implicit, so some conservative uh, assumptions were being made, but not quantified and clear to everybody exactly that that such conservative was considered. In terms of the review of the estimate, there were some deficiencies uh, focused on incompleteness of this framework. And in terms of the calculation of the one year default rate, again, there were some issues in terms of the definition of default that was considered because it was found in many cases that it was not uh, consistent over time. And also in terms of the calculation it, uh, itself of the default rate, also an area where some findings were identified but here more on F1, F2 um, level. Looking to the LGDs, as I said, the area where many, the majority of the findings were indeed detected, there were issues in terms of the calculation of the realized LGD, in particular economic loss. Uh, in, in, in many situations, around 50% of the cases, cure cases had a loss of 0%. There were also some issues on restructuring loans and also on the calculating what was the diminished uh, obligation, and basically this was impacting uh, how the realized loss at the end of the day is being calculated. Another relevant topic here is uh, related with multiple defaults. So around 35% of the cases, no treatment was being dedicated to this topic. In terms of risk differentiation, there were missing or irrelevant risk drivers being considered. There was poor risk differentiation in many models. And I would say that this is one of the areas in terms of the, not only for development, but also from the validation side where banks need to dedicate further attention. And that's why in terms of the framework of review estimates, there were uh, reduced scope of tests being used and some of the, the metrics were not properly adequate. And if you look exactly to the number of findings, it, 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 it's irrelevant uh, situations that were uh, really detected. In terms of incomplete recovery processes, Incomplete cases were not being considered uh, in the LGD estimation, uh, and basically banks were focusing only on sole or closed cases, and of course this has an impact on the final estimate. On the other hand, looking to time to work out, that was also one of the areas where banks haven't clearly defined this mark in their recovery processes, and this was also impacting uh, how they should consider the cases that were lasting more than the maximum time to work out. In terms of L ELB and LGD in default, basically uh, some banks didn't have any kind of ELB or LGD in default model being applied, and, and it's not a manageable number of cases. And, and basically this was one of the areas where banks really need to um, put their efforts trying to cope both of dimensions. Looking to low default portfolios, 
75 investigations, uh, 40, 48 significant institutions. So the number of findings is more or less similar, 1,700 1, findings. In terms of the classification, so we see here a little bit harsh scenario. So 38% had F3, F4, which, which compared uh, to the 30% that I mentioned for, for, for SNEs. In terms of number of findings on average, 22, marking 48, again, of very similar uh, reality as we've seen for, for, for the retail and SME side. And at least one severe finding was raised on 96% of all the investigations related with PD and LGD. Doing now a deep dive, but not focusing on exactly on the same topics that I've just mentioned. So the rating assignment process in total gathered the most of the attention. There were some issues on the assignment dynamic and basically how banks should consider um, the rating philosophy and how this should impact the way they should monitor, uh, challenge their models, um, and also do frequent recalibrations or more frequent or less frequent. Uh, override, significant number of institutions were not following up uh, precisely the performance of overrides and also the incorporation of human judgment in some cases were not properly justified. This differentiation is exactly the same case, but here I will highlight the issues on homogeneity and heterogeneity. How could banks really prove that the consistency within risk rates or across risk rates was being ensured? Revision of CMATE also another area where further developments need to be channeled and in terms of calibration. Uh, as you know, LDPs are characterized by a low number of defaults, so there were issues on justifying the calibration of uh, assumptions, how representativeness of the data, but also of the period considered was being uh, ensured, and all of these put some, some shadows on the final calibration of those models. In terms of documentation, again, issues here on all explanations, on the range of application of the models, but also from the validation side, uh, further details should be provided by this second line of defense. In terms of LGD, I will say that uh, in terms of the number of findings, uh, calculation realized LGD is clearly the, the hot topic, and the topics are mostly the same that we have seen for SME with increased uh, importance given the low number of defaults uh, that are part of the uh, data sets. Longer than average, the same, and in terms of S3 or 4, it's besides precisely this topic, the one that is uh, gathering the majority of S3 or 4. But in terms of low default portfolios, I will say that the key topics are now gaining the momentum, and there are some industry perspectives over several of these areas that I've just mentioned, and I will ask Ken if you could please really do a deep dive on those topics, because I think they, they really deserve our time. Ken? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Louis. I think uh, this is a very important topic that uh, will become one of our agenda discussion points in our agenda in the um, next um, years, uh, simply because the uh, review work on uh, uh, low default portfolios that has been only done halfway through, and the banks obviously have until end of 2023 their respective timelines to work on their findings uh, as well as to redevelop some models. But we, we do believe um, there are some significant concerns being voiced by um, various industry lobbying groups, um, and uh, at least from three of these groups, we have received feedback along the same lines, which we wanted to discuss today, although the topic might be sounding a bit controversial. We do believe there is value in discussing this. Um, first of all, uh, the EBA uh, regulation uh, with the release of PDLGD guidelines and end of 2017 uh, obviously led to increase in risk weight assets. And several banks have the impression that ECB is practically front running the upcoming implementation of Basel IV, putting the banks, the European ones especially, at a competitive disadvantage. Uh, against the peers in global uh, competitive field um, uh, because there are no such rules uh, in other places, in geographical locations such as North America or Far East. And this also coincides with the respective institutions, IRB repair programs, and impact obviously a bit negatively the lending capacity in the difficult times of uh, pandemic outbreak. Uh, 
Um, one reason for this increase is obviously the introduction of uh, downturn LGD on the LGD estimation and MOC on the on the uh, generally both PD for PD and LGD. However, the general understanding is that the EBA guidelines uh, for the PD and LGD model development they are practically uh, geared towards coverage uh, of retail loans and they would need definitely be revised to address specific issues related to low default portfolios. And obviously more guidance is required. Transparency is sought by the detailed explanations for the modeling options. Um, best practice approaches and suggestions are missing here completely. Uh, and there is no clear idea how by limited number of default cases banks should deal uh, with PD and LGD modeling under circumstances uh, under the circumstances that there is complete lack of clarity. Um, the specific issues related to LDP, um, they're also instrumental um, establishing, um, not, as, not being able to establish, I would say, level playing field for all banks in the implementation process and technical modeling options are definitely a challenge for most of the practitioners in the marketplace. Um, there are some concerns that more shortcomings are associated uh, with this methodological guidance. Uh, ranking by expert uh, opinion uh, or near default observations being counted towards uh, real defaults. Um, are they allowed and not allowed? And if not, how to make use of shadow uh, uh, rating approach where we have no one specific ruling that will give an impression uh, that shadow rendering is the preferred approach or method. Um, here, uh, to our surprise uh, and kind of astonishment, we have found out that the new Basel document has been clearly giving up, uh, giving us an indication that the mapping method, as they call it, uh, this is the, the reference from the BCBS 424, is a BIS uh, document, obviously. Uh, is acceptable, apart from the good-bad approach, which requires, obviously, a much larger number of default cases uh, to, uh, to meet the minimum requirements. Though the EBA and ECB guidelines, especially trim guidelines from ECB, are completely silent about the technical details of this mapping approach. So this gives us rise to speculate that there is maybe a discrepancy between the ideas and thoughts of EBA and ECB, but more than that, we cannot know. We don't know. Um, one problem that we all face when we are engaged onto IRB repair programs is the interactions and the timeliness of these interactions with ECB um, is usually a matter of um, unknown uh, because there are a very limited number of workshops and workshops are not necessarily designed as such that uh, you can establish a communication. It's more like a monologue rather than like a dialogue. Um, there is no platform where the technical modeling teams can take their technical questions to ECB unless uh, they're currently doing a live ECB review work and the inspection teams have been conducting their work on the field and the GSTs are uh, open-minded and they're ready to transparently discuss some of the issues and give the ECB take. Um, by the time, but the discussion is already late because you have been already submitted your model and the technical uh, issues and difficulties you have uh, somewhat by your own means tried to solve, which happen to be uh, sometimes rushed simply because you didn't get the feedback uh, that you wanted to have. So it's it's in the retail area much less pronounced than in the non-retail area because in the retail area there is subjectively a lot of references that you can grab to find some reasonable uh, solutions for your um, predicament. Um, in the in case of um, in case of LDPs, we have. Uh, some of the number of issues um, that obviously uh, we need to emphasize. Um, one of them is the guidelines focusing on calibration rather than on the ranking, um, and this is left pretty much to the discretion of the individual banks. Um, and there is no common understanding across banks. Uh, banks use as target variables close to default re expert rankings or rankings uh, provided from the rating agencies' rating assignments. So the trim findings reveal that the LDP rating models lack at every modeling stage 
uh, across uh, uh, the model development work um, some uh, widely accepted and widely used standards. Are the ranking using the uh, ranks of the rating assignments of rating agencies or are we using as target variable their alphanumerical uh, mean PD estimation for annual um, assessment? Are we uh, not doing that and, uh, in terms of uh, attaching or mapping certain PD estimates to, to the ranks? These are all open-ended questions for which, unfortunately, there is no clarity. And as PwC and some other consultancy firms, we have been able to collect the best practice, but this is very proprietary information, and this information can only help to the clients of PwC and not necessarily to the whole industry. So therefore, I think a more healthy and constructive exchange of ideas and thoughts on technical terms uh, provided by workshops through ECB could be quite a helpful um, addition to the all, already very good uh, managed stream program uh, of ECB and we all benefit from that because the quality of models in Europe improved dramatically compared to the other parts of globe. Um, MOC calculations at great level that cause an issue as well that could lead and that leads usually in our experience to excessive conservatism inconsistencies between institutions, LDP portfolios are due to the mostly very small number of observed defaults and very diff different results can be obtained by the choice of statistical analytical methods um, to come, uh, uh, come to terms with estimation. The relatively high MOC might in terms inflate the estimation numbers so that the statistical relationship between the best estimate for PD and MGD and final regulatory values uh, breaks down. And break down, and that if that happens, obviously your MOC addition on the top of the best estimate is not necessarily the best. And one of the problem that we have been coming across at every second bank is that banks use MOC as a cover up for all type of mistakes and errors and weaknesses instead of implementing proper uh, new default definition or collecting properly MOC relevant data. All weaknesses are, are swept under the carpet of the imposed MOC, which is obviously not the objective of, in the first place, introducing MOC. But this is what happens in many countries and many places. And we have conducted an excellent survey, and thanks to the efforts of my colleague Yosef, and we will discuss this briefly uh, and how, uh, how actually some of these additional new requirements might be uh, challenging uh, in terms of increasing the risk weight assets, which was not necessarily probably the intention in the first place. Um, very different results uh, we have seen across countries in terms of MOC. In some countries, very small MOC levels are prevailing compared to other countries where higher MOC levels are pretty much on the agenda. Um, and and that, that pretty much all comes back uh, from the very simple uh, fact that the low number of default cases doesn't let you do some of this uh, trim guideline relevant uh, analytical analysis. Um, no default or higher concentration and best rating grades also complicate mapping to a proper M uh, prob probability of default master scale for the rating models uh, because the monotonicity is not in place. So meaning like if you're in your own observation of your portfolio, if you map all your exposures using a shadow rating, for instance, to the PD master scale of one of the rating agencies, the rating agencies have in every, each and every rating grade, uh, hundreds and even thousands of observations, but you have only some 20, 30, 40. So your actual observations might lack the number of defaults that is prevailing in the master scale of the rating engine, unless you have access to the data observation data of the rating agencies for the uh, for the observed default rates, you might not be able to validate your rating scale, which is a big concern right now. Um, so practically, the banks don't have usually a large number of rated cases in the respective rating grades compared to the rating agencies, so the master scale validation is practically um, not happening, or if that happens, the results are not satisfactory. And this is not a mistake of uh, actually the banks, but rather there should be an industry-wide guidance in this topic. And the master scale validation has been again uh, put backwards to other, uh, at the end of other issues in the queue, but not necessarily addressed properly at all. So generally, 
speaking, the guidelines uh, that we have been using in the last couple of years have been completely uh, missing the target related to low default portfolios, and that is the wide impression in the industry, and actually we share this view as well. Yossi? Ah, maybe one thing we've forgotten. There is a chat board on the right-hand side, and if you want to share any questions of yours with us, please use this Q&A chat board. We will be more than happy to take your questions in respective chapters of this discussion. Yosef, please, back to you. Um, yeah, I think we can. So now we would uh, like to discuss some uh, common weaknesses that we see in modeling skill. Uh, can, maybe you can pass over the controls to me if possible. So I can move on to the next slide. Thank you, thank you. Um, so, Lewis has uh, went over quite a few different modeling challenges and it became quite apparent that at every single step of the modeling, uh, uh, that there are material weaknesses that were identified by Trim. Uh, when we talk about the current state of uh, where banks uh, stand, uh, of course, uh, many redevelopments have already been uh, taken place or are in progress. So some of these weaknesses have been remediated, some are being re remediated, but we still believe that uh, there are a few critical areas where uh, further improvements could be made. So here we would present maybe a few selected uh, uh, areas where we think there are still material weaknesses even with the new redevelopments. Of course, uh, everything depends on the situation of a specific bank, and uh, for many banks, uh, the number of remaining weaknesses could be much, much larger. On this slide, uh, we show the uh, structure of a typical uh, LGD uh, model and its uh, model development process. Uh, so we start with uh, historical data, default data, realized LGD data, risk driver data, uh, development samples and calibration samples, which are constructed. Then the risk differentiation function and calibration performed for uh, in default and performing models. And then uh, um, additional uh, mock and LGD downturn add-ons uh, being added uh, in the end. Uh, when it comes to the middle part, so risk differentiation and uh, calibration to long-run average, there were material weaknesses. Some banks have already remediated that uh, by uh, developing uh, quite standardized uh, say model development procedures for scoring functions and uh, for the calibration itself. Um, for other banks, there are still weaknesses. But, but when it comes to input data and mock and LGD downturn, we think there is still material improvement to be made. So the first area which we would like to focus on is realized LGD data, so everything before modeling. And the second and third relate to mock and LGD downturn, which are add-ons after the scorecards have been developed and calibrated to a long-run average. So. If we look at the uh, uh, realized uh, LGD, so this is um, indeed the key input into the LGD uh, modeling uh, without uh, a reliable loss database uh, a model cannot uh, be built, which uh, would be accepted without any findings uh, by the supervisor, no matter how good the scoring mechanism is uh, or no matter how good uh, the uh, calibration methodology is that the bank is uh, following. And so in our experience, the construction of a reliable realized uh, LGD data set is uh, quite a time-consuming task uh, that uh, should not be underestimated in, in terms of timelines. And um, honestly, it, it uh, often is a separate uh, work stream and a model development process, which uh, takes uh, uh, as much time, if not more time, than the modeling itself and uh, is uh, perhaps more important than the modeling steps themselves. On the left-hand side here, we present some components of a realized LGD estimation. So these are probably known to most of the participants. So in EED, we have outstanding uh, amounts. Uh, we have uh, missed the interest payments, uh, accrued the capital, accrued the uh, um, uh, fees uh, before the default events. And on the right-hand side, we have uh, uh, recovery, cash flows, cost uh, cash flows, uh, and uh, as well recoveries from collected uh, fees or fines that are paid uh, by the clients. Uh, what is challenging about this process is that uh, you have to start with uh, the underlying uh, transactional data. So there could be hundreds of different uh, types of transactions uh, in accounting systems which you have to understand. Uh, 
you have to understand how they relate to the recovery process and how they can be mapped to each of the categories specified uh, here. And this is um, a time-consuming process that requires a lot of effort and it requires multidisciplinary knowledge. So uh, simple data analysis would not uh, suffice here. You would have to uh, involve uh, uh, experts from IT, experts from uh, accounting, collection experts to understand what each transaction means and, uh, uh, and uh, conduct uh, multiple review sessions uh, uh, going over specific cases. Often what would happen is uh, you would not have uh, uh, clear results uh, uh, for many types of transactions and you would not be sure uh, whether or not your transactional data is complete or of high quality. And for such purposes, you would have to conduct uh, additional reconciliation exercises against outstanding amounts, uh, for example, to make sure that the transactional data is actually coherent and uh, it corresponds to movements in outstanding amounts uh, for a given product uh, over time. The process itself is often iterative as well. So uh, we have found out that um, um, a single round of uh, uh, transaction mapping and realized LGD calculation does not suffice. Uh, at the end, you would have a lot of outliers, uh, which unless are resolved, uh, would lead to problems downstream in calibration phases because uh, um, outliers have been considered uh, in realized LGD estimation. So each outlier uh, should be uh, examined uh, and, and, and for such purposes, uh, you would have to um, uh, perform uh, rounds of reviews of specific outlier cases with uh, the collection experts and uh, try to fix uh, the bugs in either transaction mapping or realized LGD code uh, to uh, avoid such, such issues. And uh, the scripts themselves are quite complicated. So in addition to the core parts of the script, uh, there are additional components which have to be considered like uh, how to link restructuring cases uh, uh, back to their original facilities, how to treat, treat additional drawings. All of this takes uh, quite considerable time. Um, if we move on to the next slide, uh, um, we, we see some examples of what uh, some banks have been doing uh, in the past uh, to avoid such issues so due to the um, strict timelines of uh, the closure of PCB obligations, uh, some banks have found out that uh, following the process uh, uh, completely and uh, fully interpreting uh, transactional data is simply not possible within a reasonable time frame. So that's the first approach, transaction-based approach on this slide. But so to avoid such issues, some banks have followed approaches based on outstanding amounts where they use differences in outstanding amounts as proxies, proxies for recovery cash flows. And uh, they make some adjustments, uh, for example, for write-offs to make sure that write-offs, which also decrease outstanding amounts, are not misconstrued as recovery cash flows. But uh, there are weaknesses with this approach uh, because it's uh, overly conservative. So often we, what we see is that with a new default definition, there could be new clients uh, entering the LGD databases, which uh, uh, still pay uh, uh, interest, which, which still pay fees, but interest and fees uh, um, do not uh, result in decreases in uh, balance amounts. So if you simply use the changes in outstanding amounts approach, your uh, recovery cash flows would be underestimated and your LGDs would be overestimated by uh, several percentage points. So the ideal situation is, of course, to perform a proper uh, loss database construction exercise or uh, to use a mixed approach. Uh, in this mixed approach, uh, uh, what would happen is you would have a part of your database which follows the proper transactional uh, approach. So that's the parts where you manage to find the transactions and you think they're of high quality. And for a part of your portfolio, you would follow the outstanding amounts approach, and then you would compare the two. So since you have uh, both approaches, even if you use the outstanding amounts approach for some of the sub-portfolio, uh, you can still uh, make appropriate adjustments downstream and uh, make uh, um, uh, conversions from this outstanding amounts approach to a more appropriate LGD that would have been calculated using transactions.
Another issue that uh, we still see is the treatment of unresolved cases in the realized LGD estimation. So uh, here, um, in, in, in the event that uh, uh, the facility is unresolved uh, at the end of the RDS, um, you would have to forecast what the future recoveries would be uh, for such a facility. And uh, the issue with this is that, uh, um, in our view, there is no uh, one style approach that fits all portfolios. So what we've seen in the past that, uh, is that often the methodologies used by banks are quite strict and quite uh, mechanic. So here on the left-hand side, we have an example of such a methodology which uh, relies on a regression uh, between past recoveries uh, and uh, future recoveries. So based on the volume of past recoveries, you can forecast what the future recoveries would be. But often, if you use such um, an approach, uh, you could uh, realize that uh, the output does not uh, make uh, full sense. So, for example, it could be uh, conservative. So, realized LGDs for such cases could be quite high, uh, which might be uh, good uh, for uh, the supervisor because uh, the uh, final RWEs are conservative. But uh, uh, but it leads to kind of misalignment uh, between uh, the expectations about what the proper uh, riskiness of the portfolio is and what you actually use on RME estimation, and it penalizes uh, the bank unnecessarily. So we should be very careful about interpreting uh, the outputs uh, of uh, any approach to treatment of uh, unresolved cases and uh, and uh, 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 work out what the most appropriate approach would be for a given portfolio. So in case the results are not sensible, for example, you would have to look at whether or not the maximum workout period was uh, correctly identified, or you can think about a more refined approach so instead of, for example, using uh, uh, a mechanic approach described on the slide, think about what would actually happen to collateral sales in the future uh, when uh, the uh, case is closed and uh, try to work out future recoveries based on available collateral and information about uh, past uh, sales, haircuts, or collaterals. Uh, next, uh, we can cover a margin of conservatism. So first, uh, just to quickly present uh, the topic. Uh, so this is the add-on uh, that has to be added to the models at the very end to account for uncertainty in uh, the modeling process or statistical uncertainty. So for MOC, there are three different categories of mock that have to be considered. The first category is anything related to uh, data or methodological deficiencies. That's called category A in, in the regulation. Category B relates to issues with representativeness, so changes to underwriting standards, risk appetite, collection processes, or policies over time. And finally, category C is the general estimation error, so that's statistical uncertainty, for example, due to low sample sizes uh, for the portfolio. Uh, and for these deficiencies, uh, the regulation allows us to perform appropriate adjustments, so to um, to um, try to come up with the best estimates uh, for the model and to calculate MOC on top of this uh, best estimates. And the values post mock are the ones which would be driving uh, risk weighted assets, as that's what's uh, being used uh, in, in the final counts. Um, what we see currently is that uh, uh, banks are still struggling with defining uh, uh, mock quantification approaches. So uh, e even though modeling teams have quite a good idea of what the deficiencies are and, uh, and they are aware of what types of shortcuts they took uh, during the modeling phase, um, in, in many banks uh, there are still no precise or defined uh, mock quantification approaches that are used. And, uh, uh, and uh, simply put, uh, if, if an approach is expert-based, or not mathematically rigorous, it, it would of, always be questioned by supervisors in our view or by the validation team. And uh, uh, providing qualitative, qualitative explanations would not be sufficient uh, to avoid the findings. Uh, 
what we think uh, should be done in such cases? Uh, well, there, there are two things. So one is uh, we should try to avoid mock as much as possible by thinking structurally during the model development phase how to solve issues in such a way that they don't lead to MOOC. And uh, secondly, uh, we should invest uh, uh, quite considerable time in mock quantification. I'll maybe go through a few examples of, of how this could be done. So, for instance, for category A, deficiencies related to the target uh, variable, so in case we don't have proper uh, realized LGD data, uh, the way to avoid mock is, of course, to invest the time in building out uh, the loss database, uh, as I tried to describe before, instead of using proxy approaches through uh, changes in outstanding amounts, for example. As well, uh, since there could be a lot of uncertainties related to DOD, uh, so spending time to build out a historical simulation of the new DOD that is as complete as possible uh, would be very beneficial. Of course, it could be many, many months of work, but, uh, but uh, it would be uh, very difficult at the end of the model development process with uh, no historical simulation done to come up with a mock quantification approach uh, that would be accepted uh, by a validation team or by a supervisor if, if some effort was not invested in this. If you were to quantify mock, uh, then you have to ensure uh, right from the outset, so as soon as you identify deficiency, that you can find a control sample uh, for which uh, uh, you can estimate what the true value of the realized LGD would be, or PD in the example of uh, PD models. So you have to have a clean uh, uh, sample where you can use both the imputation approaches that uh, you would have used in the historical NDS, RDS and the clean approach. So in the example I gave before, even if you use the delta outstanding amounts approach for realized LGD, you have to have uh, a subsample for which you use transactional uh, data properly. Otherwise, it would be very difficult to come up with a proper uh, mock quantification. I will maybe not go through the details for each uh, type of uh, uh, deficiency, but maybe to point out a few other examples. So for representativeness, if we want to avoid mock, uh, this uh, could be done for many types of uh, representativeness issues upstream if you simply invest a bit more time uh, during the model development. So if we know that a certain product type has been discontinued, Maybe we need to think how to isolate it in a separate pool or a separate submodel so that uh, all, all the deficiencies uh, related to representativeness are isolated within this, within this submodel and uh, we don't have to worry about uh, mock quantification for the vast majority of the portfolio that will remain on a go-forward basis. And uh, if, if you would want to quantify mock, uh, again, clearly isolating uh, uh, deficiencies uh, would be required uh, uh, such that you would be able to actually uh, compare the uh, defected uh, deficiencies historically, so for example, product types which are discontinued from the go forward uh, product types that will still be in the bank's, bank's portfolio in the future. Um, in the case of changes in recovery processes, it will be quite similar. So if there's a change and uh, you know that uh, certain types of observations went through a certain recovery node uh, of the process and, and now there is less observations going through a certain recovery node. So for example, uh, going through uh, sales uh, to, to a third party or going through restructuring, you can always compare in the historical data sets uh, what were the realized LGDs for restructured versus non-restructured cases, for the sold cases versus not sold cases. And either you can isolate such cases uh, in, in separate submodels or nodes, or uh, once you've uh, identified uh, what the defects are, you will be able to come up with a mock quantification for them uh, by, by defining these uh, deficiency groups uh, uh, rigorously. Uh, for category C, um, unfortunately, mock cannot be avoided. Uh, uh, one common mistake that we see is uh, that if you use uh, confidence intervals based on uh, normal distributions or bootstrapping, um, we should pay particular attention to how the samples are constructed. If we have overlapping samples uh, in PD models, uh, for example, or in LGD in default models where we have 
observations which are repeating themselves every single month, then uh, uh, this could lead to autocorrelation issues. So samples can become quite huge, confidence intervals will become quite small, and the actual mock uh, would be uh, too small uh, in, in such a case, uh, and, and this would simply not be accepted by a supervisor. So these are just a few examples of how we can avoid mock and how we can quantify it. So, uh, but of course, uh, uh, what's important to note is that uh, every situation is different, so we should invest quite a lot of uh, time uh, because uh, the mock uh, deficiencies, they're, they're, they're they're specific to each type of model. Maybe a few final ideas about mock. So if we have a lot of mock items, so some modeling teams identify quite a lot of them, so more than 50 in some cases, um, it's important to uh, really think uh, uh, what is a deficiency and what's not a deficiency. So the EBA guidelines provide a list of uh, the subtypes of deficiencies. And uh, if uh, a deficiency is simply um, something that's a model weakness, but not caused by uh, data issues or by methodology issues, perhaps there's no need to quantify it. So if uh, you achieve a certain discriminatory power, but use the, all the risk drivers prescribed by regulation, th there is no way you can quantify more further. You've followed uh, the methodology as you should have followed. You've used as much data as possible. So, so maybe for such types of things, uh, you should uh, uh, recognize that uh, there are simply model limitations, but not uh, model deficiencies that require more quantification. And for the rest, uh, which require more quantification, in case of limited resources, prior prioritization would be needed. Um, um, in case mock levels are uh, too high, uh, as I mentioned before, so one think we can do is perform appropriate adjustments up front to, uh, to avoid the uh, mock, or to think how to quantify mock uh, in uh, a structured way where similar deficiencies are assessed uh, together. So, uh, for example, in the case of uh, PD models, we often have issues with the uh, uh, DOD triggers. And if we assess the impact from each individual DOD trigger in the a separate simulation, for example, for mock, we would see that we are um, we have quite significant uh, mock uh, add-ons for each one of them, and then if we add them, uh, the mock could become unrealistic. But often, DOD triggers are quite uh, correlated. So if you reach uh, 90 days past due, for example, um, you would be then uh, uh, denounced uh, uh, in, in many banks. Uh, so such things are correlated and should be considered uh, together in uh, single simulations. And this could even um, uh, reduce the computational time uh, for uh, mock assessment. And of course, as well, it, it would help uh, uh, decrease mock. Uh, I think we're uh, a bit pressed for time, so I will speed up at this stage. Um, about mock for COVID, uh, uh, of course, it's still an open uh, topic. Uh, so, so here the only thing you can note is that uh, if it's purely uh, kind of for macroeconomic uh, changes, then uh, maybe it's something that should not be considered because uh, macroeconomic fluctuations are not part of mod B. But of course, uh, uh, there are a lot of process changes that will have to be cleaned out. Just uh, for this. Uh, um, uh, a bottom-up uh, rigorous approach is needed, and some time is actually needed to see where we land uh, post-COVID. So when moratoria are lifted, for example, then we, we can see uh, how time to work out or how recovery cash flows were affected for, um, for observations which were affected uh, by moratoria and compared to uh, pre-COVID uh, measures uh, um, and perform appropriate adjustments uh, uh, based on this. But of course, what we have to um, uh, understand is that uh, in order to actually quantify this, we have to have a good picture of where we will be post-COVID. So we need to understand, will we return to our normal situation and what will it be like? So will, will it be like uh, uh, pre-COVID or will we still have ongoing uh, moratoria or ongoing forbearance measures uh, uh, in the future? 
but if we know that they will end and uh, we will go back to normal credit uh, policies and uh, recovery procedures, uh, then it should be possible to isolate uh, the clients which were affected by this and uh, compare them to uh, clients earlier in the RDS uh, which, uh, which have not been affected. Uh, finally, on uh, uh, LGD Delta, um, so I will not go through the uh, basics uh, itself. So the basics is that uh, first you have to identify downturns through macroeconomic factors, and then you have several approaches to quantify a downturn. Uh, so I will, I will maybe uh, jump in straight to some uh, weaknesses or issues that we see uh, in, in some banks. So the first uh, issue with some banks is that uh, uh, the selection of uh, downturn periods is, is often unrealistic. So often banks try to be more rigorous than they have to be in, uh, uh, in identifying downturn periods, and they try to collect as much data as possible. So many microeconomic drivers which are not prescribed by the regulation, they try to have uh, extensive uh, downturn periods, which are quite long, so sometimes three, four years uh, uh, long. And they look uh, at internal loss data, internal, internal default data, to try to see where the period was the worst and align uh, somehow downturn with this worst period. But the identification of downturn um, is, is not uh, supposed to be linked, uh, as per the latest regulatory requirements, with the actual internal uh, loss data or with uh, uh, 20, 30 microeconomic uh, drivers. So there's a specific list of microeconomic drivers that should be followed. And, uh, and uh, identification should be based strictly on, on them uh, with the actual idea of the regulator that uh, a bank uh, uh, lending to the same type of portfolio, so the mortgages uh, in a given country should uh, end up with a similar downturn period or an identical one to another bank in the same country. So we should not overcomplicate uh, the actual downturn identification process. Now, when it comes to quantification, uh, there, there could be quite a few challenges. Uh, one uh, common challenge is that uh, the regulation uh, requires us to look not only at impacts on realized LGDs, but also on the components, so to look at how 12-month recoveries are affected, cure rates, and how time in default is affected. And when we look at each component and then uh, reconstruct everything back together, the results could be sometimes a bit uh, silly. So we can, we can see that uh, the impact on each component is quite high. And because the model is based on a component approach, when it's built back together, the, uh, the uh, downturn LGDs could be even worse than uh, the realized LGDs in the worst period. So here we have to be careful how we analyze everything and how we link everything back to a final realized LGDs. It's important to know that the intention of the regulation is not to, uh, at least the latest version of the regulation, is not to make downturn LGD unrealistic. So if uh, we see that uh, uh, for uh, one uh, uh, component uh, the impact is quite high, but for another component uh, the impact is uh, not there at all, uh, the intention is uh, to uh, link uh, final realized LGDs for downturn to the worst uh, component. So if cure rates are affected the most, then the effect from the cure rate would be the maximum uh, effect uh, on the realized LGD. And, and this requires uh, uh, some sense checks and, uh, and some analysis of how to link everything uh, back to realized LGDs. But for sure, you should not have uh, uh, downturn LGDs, which are worse than the, the worst uh, realized OGDs that uh, you've experienced during the downturn. And the final notes on downturn. Uh, so again, COVID uh, is uh, an issue. So in terms of the GDP uh, microeconomic driver, uh, the downturn for uh, most European countries is actually uh, right now, so as it was uh, uh, last year. So. We still don't have data on realized LGDs, so we don't know what will actually happen. Um, and here, uh, there are no perfect solutions, but uh, as a short-term solution, if, if you're developing a model right now, one possible approach is to uh, 
use the extrapolation approach, which is allowed by regulation, so build a microeconomic model, which uh, 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 tries to find the relationship between GDP and uh, fuel rates, realized LGDs, uh, uh, workout periods, etc. And if you can uh, build a viable extrapolation approach, you can forecast what the effect of the downturn will be in the future. And if you cannot, uh, then uh, uh, then uh, there is no link with uh, macroeconomic uh, drivers uh, and realized LGD, and you simply use the previous downturn period from 2009 or 2010. And then in the midterm, when we have some data, so in one year time, for example, when uh, uh, when uh, the effects of COVID are more visible, we can already see, if not the effect on realized LGDs, because workout periods are quite long, at least we can see the effect on 12 months key rates, 12 months recovery rates, and extrapolate from them what the impact uh, would, would be. But of course, uh, uh, it's understandable that this will take some time. Um, and uh, finally, for process changes uh, for, for downturn, we have to be careful as well. So often in the earlier downturn periods, LGDs could be inflated, not only because it was a downturn period, but because the process for recoveries was a little bit different. Uh, just to give one example, uh, there could be an issue with understaffing in the recovery team, which has led to higher LGDs in earlier periods which is now sold. So, for example, a bank that performs outsourcing or has a fully staffed recovery team, and we have to isolate the impact from the tool. So, if realized LGDs were inflated partially because of understaffing, which is now not an issue anymore because the recovery process has changed, um, it would be advisable to spend some time to decouple the effects uh, and, and ensure that the effect is not fully taken through the downturn. That's it uh, from me. Uh, Maybe I'll have um, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Josef. Um, if you can move the ball on to me, thank you. I think uh, now we will come to the interesting part of our discussion, namely the uh, survey. Uh, the survey have been conducted across uh, 15 uh, uh, major financial institutions, banks in Europe. Uh, this is um, this, this regions are mostly um, best European uh, countries, uh, goes down from Ireland down to Belgium, Luxembourg, and we are covering 15 major institutions representing roughly 20% uh, of the European asset base. Uh, these are major institutions uh, for all uh, to maybe to understand. Um, and here, the question, one of the first questions we asked was, um, how uh, has been the number of models uh, influenced or impacted by um, by the uh, trim as well as by EVA uh, new regulation. And approximately half of the banks in the sample have experienced increase in the number of models. Primarily, um, this is related to the uh, additional split of larger rating uh, systems uh, due to the introduction of dedicated in default LGD models because the in default LGD models have been proving to be one of the weakest links in the uh, ECB review. Um, many banks have not have dedicated in default LGD models, and they have introduced that. And due to that, I think there was an increase among uh, the respondents uh, who experienced the decrease in the number of models. There were several reasons. One of them has been noted that the advanced RB is reversed to foundation or to the standardized approach, and in some cases, uh, I mean, all banks basically experience some reversion, and that's uh, kind of front running. Uh, the uh, BIS requirements uh, simply because the BIS requirements um, have been um, predicting that uh, the banks will not necessarily be having LGD mall coverage in the non-retail area except the uh, exposures to the states and uh, similar entities. So in a nutshell, uh, several banks have been decreasing the number of model development in the area of non-retail. And as well as some of the ones are removing uh, their IRB status because it's simply tedious or it takes too long to uh, cover all of the um, IRB requirements for some of the nitty gritty uh, entities uh, and exposure classes. Um, the second question we asked was, um, are you ready to deliver uh, the IRB models according to the new 
configuration of uh, EBA ECB guidelines uh, within the next year. And most banks answered that uh, in a mixed setting, like until the end of 2022 or during 2023, roughly 60% uh, gave the answer, which corresponds to roughly nine banks out of 15 that they will be probably done by end of 23 if no hiccups um, should be expected in the course of uh, this model development. Um, we asked respondents if they also follow a common strategy. Um, well, the common strategy, as we have been seeing in some major markets um, like um, Netherlands or Belgium, which is starting with PD model development and moving up to LGD and CCF, and, and then finally, in the last uh, corner uh, also covering the non-retail. A third of them confirmed the strategy. A majority of the banks has specified, among other reasons, uh, that the existing obligations and materiality of the portfolios have been taken into uh, consideration, and that was one of the reasons. And we'll, we asked uh, about the increase in final uh, PD and LGD uh, estimation values as a result of um, IRB model redevelopment uh, upon the re uh, upon the uh, release of PD LGD guidelines and trim uh, relevant guidelines and um, retail mortgage PD estimates, for instance, being the least impact among others, which was obviously expected um, because we we're also expecting an increase in the uh, LGD for the mortgages, uh, which is also proved to be what the banks are experiencing at this very moment in time. For uh, SME and large corporate exposures, approximately one-third of the banks have been reporting increases higher than 20%. Um, and and that's, that's, I think, um, one uh, um, maybe reason. I'm sorry, I have not been able to move the slide, so you might have missed this last point. Um, and but again, as we mentioned earlier, we will share the slides and material. So in that sense, you will have access to that. But bear in mind that um, this this uh, survey is completely conducted within the PwC network, and this is nothing that you can substantiate as a reference point. It's more like a yardstick that uh, gives us an idea how the uh, the new regulation rules introduced by um, EBA and ECB have been having an effect on, on the way we estimate the PD and LGD. Um, for, uh, again, that ex was expected for SME and large corporate exposures, approximately one-third of the banks are reporting increases um, higher than 20%, which was for us a bit more than we expected, um, and that actually to be reattributed mostly to the fact that banks um, using now for their uh, PD models uh, MOC and then lack usually in large corporate segment um, a sufficient number of default cases or default cases are hardly meeting the minimum statistical threshold of, um, uh, of, of conducting a proper modeling. And um, very high impact was also observed for large corporate LGD, which is uh, um, actually align quite a bit with uh, what the lobbying groups have been um, in the recent past, as mentioned earlier, giving as feedback to ECB and their local regulators, our increase uh, can be explained mostly by imposed MOC uh, because the limited number of default experience and the lack of representativeness causing this uh, disparity and then MOC is getting visually inflated one uh, element of, um, again, uh, concern is um, in the eyes of, of many um, uh, uh, regulators uh, that, that the fact that the uh, L for the LGD modeling, according to uh, EBA guideline, we are not allowed to make use of external data, even not for the purposes of estimating the MOC. So in that sense, there is a limitation imposed on that, and that uh, could essentially lead as well to the observation that we are not really here in the business of uh, finding an accurate estimate based on larger data sets available through data consortia. Um, for the MOC levels, uh, MOC levels are the highest for the LGD models, as expected, as compared to other uh, IRB parameters, basically. And there's no evident difference between the portfolio distributions and this can be an indication of common drivers for of MOC for LGD, such as realized LGD estimation and 
uh, incurring data deficiencies. Uh, MOC is usually perceived to be or has been usually um, shifted towards very low level buckets, so meaning like the impact of uh, uh, MOC for the final regulatory CCF estimation has been the least among all other risk parameters. Uh, finally, impact on staffing, um, because the uh, this is the area there I think um, we need to be uh, careful um, as final um, outcome. Um, interestingly, I'm stuck on the slide and I don't know how to move that for some reason. Um, I don't know why. Page, page, page down, Ken. Uh, Yosef, you still have the ball. Yeah, why are you, okay. Um, the fact is that um, uh, that the stuffing uh, has been constrained was clearly um, the reason because the budget has been uh, unfortunately cut uh, across the board for the risk functions, validation functions and model development functions with the low profitability in various countries in Europe. And this is actually a sheer fact. I mean, that cannot necessarily uh, be uh, forgotten, but the fact is that ECB practically sees the validation teams as their uh, co-workers, as their uh, external uh, uh, support within the bank before and after they start a, a respective review. So meaning like the, the function, as a function, validation needs to be uh, strengthened and has been, uh, uh, has been not necessarily taken care of as such, um, at least along the lines of ECB expectations. Um, that you can see as well in the in the survey. Uh, and the survey says less than half of the respondents have faced significant challenges in uh, in meeting the requirements towards validation function. An increased flow of model redevelopment resulting in growth of stuffing by more than one one fourth of every uh, of, of the sample uh, that we that we have uh, here among the banks. Um, and then they also mentioned that increased validation function and increased responsibility and task of validation function um, by more than 50% over the course of IRB redevelopment. And they don't necessarily need uh, as well, uh, they, they were not able to meet as well uh, the timely uh, submission of validation related inquiries, questioning and uh, all other tasks. So in other words, the validation functions have been stretched out to the limit uh, and they're not necessarily being able actually to be uh, beefed up by additional personnel uh, as they've been probably requesting from the uh, from the uh, key stakeholders in the in the bank management simply because uh, their budget cuts across the board. That's something I read into between the lines and um, based on that, I think, um, the ECB expectations cannot necessarily be met if uh, these budget constraints are going to be in the future as well prevailing. Um, overall impact, uh, expected impact was as well for us not a surprise. Um, roughly three quarters, 75% of respondents expected overall increase in risk weight assets by more than 10%. Almost no respondent, actually no respondent ever ex uh, responded uh, that expected risk rate assets will remain stable or decrease. Um, that's, uh, and that's, I think, one of the key facts, and that uh, that's uh, substantiate as well the view of the lobbying uh, bodies across the board. And now I think we reach to our uh, final um, um, final stage. Luis, you want to uh, give the conclusions? Sure, Ken. Thank you. So before going to the questions that you you may have, so so basically overall, so the trim exercise proved that, that the the RV models are suitable for for regulatory purposes, in particular for for capital requirements calculations. Uh, there were deviations and significant deviations, in particular moving to more to LDP and in terms of its parameters going to the LDD, but in part or in relevant part. This is due to evolving regulatory uh, action from, from DBA since 2016, and basically uh, this was the expected scenario. Uh, nevertheless, banks need to, 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 to focus significant efforts on remediating all the deficiencies and bringing on board the new expectations, and they shall continue to invest on, on the validation and audit functions 
because the, the, the recent expectation is that indeed the second line and the third line need to be more active, more challenging in the way they, they accept the modeling or the methodology developments and the final figures. In terms of the continuous improvement, so uh, as I said, TREAM is not over in terms in terms of uh, what is now being expected, of course, uh, in terms of the project itself, it, it ended up, but, but basically uh, the legacy of TRIM should continue and basically banks need to, uh, as I said, incorporate all, all the, the needed actions to solve TRIM findings, but also look to the remaining pipeline of models that indeed were not subject to the exercise. And some banks are really taking the opportunity to simplify the model landscape. So we saw one question regarding what is happening to the number of models that are now in a pipeline to be RV or to continue to be RV. So we see different trends, uh, simplification in one side, having in mind modelability uh, of the specific portfolios. In the other side, there was some regulatory pressure so that uh, in particular on the LGD side, the LGD in default, there were sort of development and specific models for, for both LGD in default and also L, separating what are the approaches, for instance, used for impairment purposes and the ones that need to be taken on for regulatory and uh, regulatory spectrum. And last but not least, I mean, DCB is not going to be uh, more lenient in the way they shall challenge these RB 2.0 um, models. So basically they will continue armed more than ever with all the information now on different practices, uh, armed with information on uh, validation results using a more or less straightforward validation process, in particular with their annexes being used for regulatory reporting. So banks should not expect any more soft reaction, uh, but, but at the end of the day, models should be, should be used for regulatory purposes and also for business. And basically, we need to have good sense in the way we redevelop our models and the final capital figures, because at the end of the day, we don't want to the over conservative by assumption. So we need to bring conservative where uncertainty exists, but not just because we need to be conservative. And I think these are the, the key conclusions of, of, of the exercise and some messages that I would like to, to leave with you. And now please feel free to use the q and mechanism. So insert your questions. Uh, and, and as I said, we'll try to tackle them, if not through, during the session afterwards, for sure in written. In the meantime, while we have some time to, to do that, so in the next slide, what we have here is some some key notes uh, in terms of the timeline. So, so basically, uh, what we see is that the next two three years will be dedicated uh, to model changes applications and bringing in uh, more on the retail later on on the LDP. What are the new models uh, looking uh, or benefiting for from all the developments that we have seen, and after that. Uh, with Basel for introduction, so basically we'll see uh, an increased number of inspections focused on the low default portfolio. Can do you want to pick up on the challenges for Frank? Yes, thank you. I think uh, some key challenges are the um, ECB obligations to respond to them um, for material model changes and redevelopment. That is still um, a main engagement of many modeling teams and validation teams, and there I think. They need external and internal uh, additional support uh, by all means. Cutting down the budgets will not help to meet the obligations. Uh, forming uh, model recalibration in the light of new default definition had been one concern, and several banks, as uh, they're not accounting for uh, proper DOD adjustment, new de the default definition adjustment, they're accounting for heavy MOC uh, layers, and that, I think, is causing some issues with risk rate asset increasing, increases. To avoid that, I think better data collection uh, would be advisable across the board. Um, and, and maybe the, the recent uh, increases of discussion topics, um, which has been partic particularly uh, um, led by the uh, popular belief that ESG should be on the forefront of the bank's um, management agenda, uh, leads to a number of new regulatory releases and ESG risk factors should be included, and that is practically uh, a new development, but will have an impact on us, uh, on the modeling teams, uh, simply because ESG factors have to be accounted. But the problem arises there when you look in the same statistical context in the multivariate analysis, uh, 
Uh, usually these factors are not necessarily coming out as statistically significant ones and they are dropping out from the shortlist. So we need to find more uh, novel ways and uh, approaches to uh, make possible that these factors are also part of the model. Having uh, this mo these factors being covered as qualitative is not necessarily something that is currently uh, in the eyes of ECB acceptable. As we understand, and there is more quantification work is happening across the ESG risk factors through the so-called climate risk stress testing, which will be initiated by the end of this year and will be particularly finalized and completed around mid uh, next year, in June, July next year. So in that sense, I think uh, all modeling teams need to take um, some actions, um, getting into uh, the data field, collecting relevant data and finding out what should be the best way of inter integrating or incorporating these factors into the PD and LGD models. There might be, uh, I think, a first step uh, towards this end. Um, the final impact on risk rate assets um, that will practically depend on improvements in data quality and improvements on methodological um, enhancements. And that, I think, is a matter of prioritization uh, of certain portfolios or, in other words, setting up a right strategy, reversing back to standardized approach uh, for some portfolios or uh, stepping, stepping back down to the foundation uh, uh, IRB uh, for some others. In that sense, I think um, everyone in the industry aware with the introduction of Basel four requirements that will eventually happen after 2023. Uh, I think with that we conclude um, our discussions today, but we got a couple questions. I think uh, one of the questions uh, you, you received, Louis, you want to uh, speak out the question and then maybe address sure. it? Yeah, we have firstly a nice comment from, from Mr. Daniel, so uh, thank you for, for the nice words. Regarding the question, so we have a question from Mr. Rosema, so basically saying that based on the presentation, it seems that differences of MOC and downturn practices can be considered to be a source of unwarranted, unwarranted warranty, sorry, variability of risk rate assets. Are you of the opinion that more prescriptive regulatory guidelines are required in these areas, and do you expect these? And do you want to take it? Uh, no, I think you should go ahead because it's coming from no, your corner. Yeah, very, I mean, very personal view. Uh, I, I think EDA has been working significantly to, to reduce all the sources of different practices that were not justified by, indeed, by uh, bringing more risk sensitiveness into the process. But indeed, the MLC has been gaining the importance of also a miracle pill. So basically, everything should be captured under the MLC. But I do agree with you that there is a lot of uncertainty on how the MLC framework can be put in place. Of course, we have described some, some options and some, some situations in this call, but there is no straightforward approach, and indeed regulation may need to evolve to, to avoid that all the work that has been done so far uh, across the different parameters is not, at the end of the day, somehow destroyed or distorted by very different assumptions on the MOC. In terms of the downturn, I'm not so confident that we'll have further guidance in the future. We have two different documents. Uh, a lot has been written in this area. Probably we may have some clarification, but I don't expect uh, such a significant uh, or relevant new guidance in this area, at least a further document uh, here. We could have some fine tuning, but not at all. Uh, a complete new uh, RTS or guidelines or any other document from, from or any guidance from DCV in particular. But the MLT, yes, I strongly agree with you that, that we'll see some future action in the next two, three years, no doubt from that. Um, do you want to add something? Yeah, I think MLC is, uh, is really uh, for the LVP is not designed for the uh, low default portfolios and they have to be some methodological adjustments as well. And this uh, can only happen unless ECB is having the com contrary view on that, which we haven't heard yet, uh, once they start addressing all the low default portfolio issues. And we have just, um, I think, scratched here the bottom of the barrel because um, at the end of the day, the LDP approaches, especially the shadow rating, has a lot of technical um, um, uh, quantities that one needs to explore in more detail. and. You see, we have been um, giving us complete um, new um, testing uh, tools. Um, 
just to identify the differences between rating grades and the homogeneity within the rating grades. And if you are so working out in detail fashion all those technical details for the retail portfolios or generally speaking for any type of portfolios, but then actually completely becoming silent when it comes which approach which we should we should use in the in the area of uh, no defaults or in the area of low defaults that is uh, uh, for some people including myself not easily um, uh, understandable i mean there i think needs to be um, further clarification all, all of this low default area has been treated like a foster child um, by ecb in the recent years and i think more movements uh, can happen in the regulatory area on this and i think we have indication for that but one uh, message that I'm taking seriously to my heart from the whole trim report is as well the increasing importance of validation and the increasing importance of uh, cooperation within the validation within the validation and the, the development teams. And that has been voiced with very strong um, accent uh, for the for the general audience uh, through the report, as my colleague um, uh, Louis mentioned. Um, we got one more question um, that came off the line. The question is um, whether we think there will be uh, new methodologies introduced in the low default area. Well, the short answer is no. Uh, I think we had in the past a lot of models built based on expert ranking, which is apparently, as we understand, through different channels and through different experiences where, uh, during um, the ECB review work at different client sites, basically, not a go on, uh, not, not a go ahead anymore. We basically don't, they don't really like to have the expert ranking approach. So that means the only option is left is the shadow rating and using the external ratings and the PD corresponding to this external ratings. And, and for that reason, I think specific guidelines is very much needed in the industry because there's no one approach that prevails um, in terms of uh, modeling and calibration of such such models, but we have already uh, mentioned that um, very specifically in the in the chapter when we are addressing the concerns and critical reviews the industry has been providing to the regulators. Um, another question came about uh, the timelines. Um, the timelines is. Uh, as we might know, by end of 2023, uh, the LDP models need to be done. But we see this also very critical because several banks not even have started collecting data. And given the sheer workload the current those banks are currently undergoing, um, we don't see them meeting these deadlines. A probable deferral of these deadlines on individual bank cases uh, is is on the agenda, and I think every other bank is renegotiating their uh, submission deadlines uh, due to Corona with the ECB and their local regulators. So in that sense, there is nothing new uh, in this on this front. Um, you uh, will receive as well um, the recording of this um, uh, webinar session and the material and the slide deck. And if you have any colleagues or any co-workers that might be interested in the discussion, please, um, you know, we can forward that link particularly to uh, to your contacts as well. Luis, I don't have any other questions, do you? <laughs> Thank you. I, I have received one additional one. Maybe I'll cover it quickly. So the yeah. question is, I think we covered it partially. In some cases, the amount of time on mock could be disproportionate to the full model development time, what is good enough for mock, and how do we prevent uh, over-engineering? This is a personal opinion, but I would say if you spend more than 20 or 25 percent of the time, maybe 20 on, on the mock from the model development, it kind of implies that you did not uh, uh, build the data sets properly up front and did not design uh, the model up front. So that no matter what you do, there would be some issues lingering. So I think 20 percent uh, would be a good benchmark, but it means that you need to spend uh, more time uh, up front uh, to actually um, to actually design the data sets properly. And the way we would be, uh, prevent over-engineering, uh, so one, uh, try to solve issues upstream uh, um, by defining a proper model structure. So if you have issues with representativeness, try to isolate them into several, separate sub-models, separate pools. Uh, so that uh, you can avoid uh, quantifying them uh, later on. And the second thing is to try to analyze uh, all deficiencies rigorously and think 
are the real uh, data methodology deficiencies or just model limitations? And uh, if, if they're not real data deficiencies that would have an impact on the realized LGDs, uh, maybe there is no need for quantifying them. And the third thing, uh, to prevent over-engineering, so maybe grouping deficiencies together by topic and uh, feeding them through common quantification methodologies or simulations uh, would be a good idea. This way, even if you have a lot of them, if someone understands one from validation or from uh, from uh, um, ECB, then uh, they should be able to understand the, the other ones as well. So there could be maybe four or five types of different approaches that are used by a model development team, but the number of deficiencies could be actually larger. They're, they're just bunched up together and treated uh, in, in similar fashions. So that, that's uh, all I have to say on this question. There is uh, one more question, Yosef. I think this is for you. Uh, what is the view, or your view, on the regulators suggest the discounting rate? Uh, should that be the same for best estimate uh, uh, LBA models? Um, the development team claims this regulator suggests the discounting rate 5% plus X4 is conservative. You know this answer as well as I know, Yosef. Well, the, the personal view could, could be that uh, we can use uh, other discounting rates which are applicable to the portfolio, but we have to strictly follow regulations. So if we have no choice, then uh, we simply have to use the uh, Eurobar uh, rate uh, plus uh, 5%. Uh, there is no way around it. I think in some countries like uh, the UK, uh, there are um, easements for that, and it's possible to use uh, based on PRA uh, guidelines uh, um, the not, 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 but, yeah. in the portfolio, but, uh, but, but not under yeah. yeah, absolutely. But maybe we should uh, conclude for today, Moish. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, thank you all for joining for today's uh, discussions and webinar. Uh, it was a um, pleasant uh, experience for us, for all of us, if I may speak for all the speakers. And we will again share all the material in the next couple of days and weeks. And uh, should you have any questions you have or contact details, please get in touch with us. We will be more than happy to, to support you on your respective undertakings. Many thanks for participating today. Thank you. Stay healthy and, and safe and enjoy the weekend. Hopefully, a yeah. sunny one. A sunny one. Yeah. Thank you very much. Enjoy the weekend. Bye-bye.